Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, friends of the World Economic Forum, it's for me a very special and personal pleasure uh, to introduce a good old friend of the World Economic Forum, Senator John McCain. I have great admiration for you, Senator, for your strategic thinking, as well as for your tactical savvy, I should say. Um, we have had the honor to welcome you on a number of occasions in the past, and we all know that um, you always have a very important message. So we are looking forward to hear your message. Please welcome Senator John McCain. Thank you, Klaus, for that generous introduction, and thank you for the opportunity to address this year's World Economic Forum at the Dead Sea. Let me also express my gratitude to His Majesty King Abdullah, Her Majesty Queen Rania, and the government and the people of Jordan for once again being such gracious hosts. When this distinguished group gathered last year in Morocco to discuss the future of the Middle East and North Africa, no one no one predicted the circumstances in which we would be meeting this year. The Ben Ali regime in Tunisia, the Mubarak regime in Egypt, the Qaddafi regime in Libya, and now Qaddafi himself, all are gone. The Assad regime in Syria is fighting brutally and unconscionably for its survival. It's unclear who controls Yemen. Every country in the region has been shaken by popular demonstrations of some degree this year. Meanwhile, the global economic recovery is more volatile and more at risk than a year ago. Amid all of this upheaval and uncertainty, there are many reasons to be anxious and cautious about the future of this region. Passions and aspirations that have been pent up for decades are now being unleashed. Expectations could not be any higher. At the same time, Dark forces in this region, especially in Iran, are working harder than ever to hijack the promise of what many are calling the Arab Spring. These concerns are real and legitimate and merit our vigilance, but if we dwell only on them, we miss the broader picture. I have traveled this year to nearly every country in the Middle East and North Africa, and whether it is in Tunisia or Egypt or Libya or elsewhere, I have met people, especially young people, who are overflowing with a sense of dignity. They have expanded the reach of justice further and faster than anyone thought possible. And many of them tell me that for the first time in their lives, they feel proud about their countries. They deserve to be. For decades, we in the United States were fed the belief that the so-called Arab street was hostile to our interests and our ideals. But now we are seeing that the opposite is true. The Arab street wants political freedom, economic opportunity, equal justice and rights, and the chance to change their countries and their governments, not through suicide and murder, but peacefully through politics. If I take any consolation in the fact that Osama bin Laden evaded justice for as long as he did, it's because he got to witness his fellow Arabs and Muslims rise up for democracy this year and demolish the foundation of every hateful thing he believed. If I take, there has always been politics in the Middle East, but until now, politics had rarely offered people a path to improve their lives. That's what's changing. And it's through politics that people in this region are now seeking answers to the most fundamental questions facing them. How to balance religious guidance and democratic responsibilities. How to reconcile the undeniable benefits of the free market with popular demands for greater equality. How to bring armed groups of all kinds from small militias to state militaries under unified civilian authority. It is the people of this region, not in the United States or any other foreign power, 
who will provide the answers to these and other important questions. But that is not to say, as some suggest, that American leadership is neither welcome nor wanted in the Middle East today. To the contrary, as I travel across this region, I have met with heads of state and young democratic activists, business leaders, and military officers, and many others. And nearly every single one of them does not want more, wants more leadership, American leadership, not less. Yes, many people in this region may be frustrated or angry with the United States, but it is more likely because they think we are not doing enough to take their side, support their cause, or act in ways consistent with our values. There is a perception here that the United States only supports democracy in the Middle East if it brings to power people or groups that we like. That is the wrong way to think about the issue. As the Middle East becomes more democratic, many groups that had until recently been excluded from politics, especially Islamist groups, are now joining the political process. That's just a fact. America should welcome the inclusion in the democratic process of any person or group, regardless of what they believe, provided they have renounced violence for political purposes and are committed to the basic ground rules of democracy. Furthermore, we should evaluate any freely and fairly elected government, not by the personalities or groups that compose it, but by the action that government takes, whether it works for peace and security, whether it works, abides by the law, rule of law and its international agreements, whether it protects the basic rights of its people, including religious freedom and minority rights, and how it manages its nation's economy. Islamist parties can play an important role in making responsible policies like these, and we encourage their efforts to do so. The people I meet throughout this region are not concerned that American support will discredit their cause. That is more a fixation of American minds. The concern I hear most often expressed is that American support will not be extended to them. People in the Middle East are risking more than ever today for the sake of their own freedom and opportunity, and what they want to know from us is, does America stand with them? Can they count on American support? Will America run risks of its own to support their aspirations? Not just when that support is most convenient for us, but when it is most wanted, most needed, and most urgently sought by them. This is increasingly the question about Syria. The Assad regime has spilled too much blood to stay in power. Its days are numbered, but it will use those days to murder more of its own people. In this way, there is no moral distinction whatsoever between the case of Syria and that of Libya. The question is, what can be done about it? The Syrian revolution may now be entering a new phase. The opposition has formed the Syrian National Council and is seeking to better organize itself. There are increasing reports of defections from the army. More Syrians appear to be taking up arms against the regime. There are even growing calls among the opposition for some kind of foreign military intervention. We hear these pleas for assistance. We are listening to and engaging with the National Council. And now that military operations in Libya are ending, there will be renewed focus on what practical military options might be considered to protect civilian lives in Syria. The Assad regime should not assume that it can get away with mass murder. Gaddafi made that mistake, and it cost him everything. Iran's rulers would be wise to heed a similar counsel. Their plot to assassinate the Saudi ambassador in Washington has only reminded Americans of the threat posed by this regime, how it is killing Americans in Iraq and Afghanistan, supporting violent groups across the region, destabilizing Arab countries, propping up the Assad regime, seeking nuclear weapons, 
and trampling on the dignity of Iran's people. No issue unifies the American people and their representatives in Congress more than the need to protect our friends, our allies, and our interests from the comprehensive threat posed by the Iranian regime. No one should test our resolve in this matter. Beyond security and politics, the people and leaders I meet across this region are perhaps most eager for American support for their economic aspirations. That is much or more than any other issue, as we know, is what first sparked the Arab Spring, and that in large part will be most decisive in whether the Arab Spring succeeds. For if democracy does not meet people's expectations for jobs and opportunity and a better life, the backlash against it could be harsh. As one young woman told me in Tunisia, it is not the first election we worry about, it's the second election. In this regard, the major economic challenge for the Middle East is similar to that faced by young democracies in Latin America over the past two decades. How to maintain popular support for free market policies that foster economic growth while developing responsible social policies that enable more people, especially the poor and the disadvantaged, to share in the benefits of that growth. In an economic context, if the dem democratic aspirations of the Arab Spring can be translated into sound policies that reduce poverty and inequality, the Middle East will have a far more durable and sustainable model of economic development. That's a big if, I know. But there's no turning back now. And here, too, people I meet across this region, especially young people, are eager for American leadership. They appreciate our foreign aid, but far more than that, they want our investment, our technical assistance, and access to our economy so they can provide for themselves. The single most powerful tool that America has to support the Arab Spring is free trade, and we need to think a lot bigger about using it. For example, I can envision a regional trade agreement between the United States and the transitional states of North Africa from Morocco to Egypt. Such an agreement could not only boost trade between us, but it could also enable those countries to expand trade among themselves and ultimately to transform their region into the thriving nexus of North, South, and East, West commerce that it can and should be. We should explore a similar idea with our friends along the Gulf, including Iraq. Are there obstacles and limitations to ideas like these? Of course there are. But the United States should never allow the primary problem to be our own lack of will and imagination. This is no time for America to be taken in by self-fulfilling self prophecies of our own decline. There is simply too much riding on the outcome of the Arab Spring. Indeed, it is already having implications far beyond this region. I have met people from Burma and Belarus and Cuba who are inspired by the people of this region. I think the Chinese and Russian governments are more anxious today about their own people's repressed desire for greater liberty. The Arab Spring may have been born here, but its aspirations are universal and its impact will be too. America did not cause the Arab Spring, but we must help its cause succeed. The people of the Middle East and North Africa are looking right now to see who their true friends are. It may take them a month, it may take them a year, it may take them a decade, but eventually they will gain control of their own destinies and when they do, they will long remember who stood with them in their hour of greatest need. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator McCain, and uh, welcome to this very important part of our uh, afternoon. It's a great panel. We will have a discussion independent of what Senator McCain said, or if anybody wants to make any comment on what Senator McCain said, certainly they'll feel free. Let me introduce uh, my panel first. Uh, uh, of course, we'll start right immediately next to me. 
Um, Mr. Amr Musa is the Secretary General of the Arab League for 10 years until 2011. And uh, then next to him is Mr. Anwar Gargash. He's a Minister of State for Foreign Affairs of the United Arab Emirates. Next is uh, Robert Hormetz, and he's the U.S. Under Secretary of State for Economic, Energy, and Agricultural Affairs. Then I think I have um, uh, Mr. Abdul Aziz Al-Ghurair, and uh, I have him here somewhere. Here we go. Chief, um, he's the CEO of uh, Mashraq Bank and the UAE and Chair of the Arab Business Council. And last but not least is Miriam uh, Sapiro, the Deputy U.S. Trade Representative. Welcome all. So let us start with a notion that I'd love to get your reaction to with all of you. Is this U.S.-Arab relationship one between the dysfunctional and the disintegrated? Mr. Amr Musa. Well, I prefer to, uh, to confirm our basic point of view that we need a solid and productive relationship between the Arab world, Arab countries, and the United States. I like the idea expressed right now by Senator McCain about a free trade area in North Africa and uh, another uh, one for the Gulf and Iraq. This is the kind of uh, economic plan and economic uh, uh, cooperation that would benefit both sides. Of course, as Senator McCain has just said, touring the Arab world, he found that the Arabs have a lot of affection for the U.S., but there are also a lot of issues that need to be reconsidered and revisited, especially in the political and security area. Therefore, we have to make it work. We have to make it function on a new basis that uh, take into consideration the new situation in the Arab world, the change that is affecting all of us. This is a historical change. It will remain with us for so many years to come, and it has to be taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. We need a solid relationship and an equal relationship that is the mutual interests of both sides being taken into consideration, be them political, economic, or otherwise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I am optimistic about that, especially that the new uh, uh, setup in the Arab world will certainly take into consideration not only the internal developments, but the regional developments, Excellent. where we need peace and we need stability and we need a new page to be opened rather than to follow the practices of the past. Mr. Gagash, the traditional relationship between the Gulf states and the United States had been one of security, basically, mostly. Um, is this going to be the cornerstone still? And would the idea that uh, there is so much disintegration in the Arab world and that there is dysfunctional U.S. as it perceived by the world now, uh, how would that affect the cornerstone of your relationship? I, I would argue that uh, the relationship with the United States is uni not unidimensional. I think it uh, involves a nexus of uh, security, uh, economics, and developmental uh, relationship, I think, with, uh, with the region as a whole. But uh, as you rightly said, uh, that in view of uh, uh, the Arab Spring, and these are historical events, uh, the, I think that the relationship needs to be revisited. And I think that uh, revisiting that uh, relationship will take into account uh, many, many, uh, you know, uh, I, I would say monumental changes in the Arab world. I think any uh, revisit of the relationship would uh, involve uh, building the relationship uh, from a Gulf perspective at least uh, along lines of transparency, I think predictability, and uh, at the same time uh, longevity. So basically transparency, we need to know uh, what the U.S. is thinking and what the U.S. Uh, wants to do, and uh, predictability is what to expect from it and longevity that we are also not seeing uh, short-term shifts uh, in, in the policy. So, uh, you know, to summarize, uh, the relationship is multidimensional, intertwined, uh, cannot be really uh, reduced uh, to a simple uh, single banner, but at the same time that there is this uh, 
concern about rebuilding the relationship along the lines that I said. Uh, Mr. Hamas, why don't you take it from there? Do we see a new rise of alliance, um, different kind of alliance between the United States as part of NATO and Arab states, particularly led by the GCC? Do you see that this is a new formation of the relationship? Is it sustainable? Well, I don't know about an alliance per se, but I do think that the United States has traditionally had a very substantial security relationship in the region. And let me discuss this in a slightly broader context, and that is, this is clearly one of the defining moments in the history of all of our lives, particularly people in the Arab world. This is a dramatic moment in history, and these come along very rarely, but this is certainly one of them. But it's also in many ways a defining moment for the United States in the following sense. And that is, throughout the last 200 years, certainly the last 50 or 60 years, the United States has been the great proponent around the world during the Cold War, when Cold War issues were at the top of our agenda, and then afterwards as well, that we have been sort of the defining nation in terms of supporting democratic reforms, supporting democracies, supporting market-oriented reforms uh, around the world. We have made this a major element of our foreign policy because it's a major element of our domestic values at home. Mm -hmm. So for the United States, this is also a defining moment. Will we step up and do the kind of things that are needed to support the reforms mm -hmm. in the region. And it seems to me that is what is critically important for us to focus on at this point. Now, the constraint we have is that given our own domestic budget circumstances, we don't have the same kind of resources that we ha would have had had this occurred five or six or seven years ago, mm -hmm. which means we have to use new techniques and be much more innovative in what we're doing. And I think Senator McCain pointed this out very well. One of the things we can do is to help increase opportunities for American companies to invest in the region and create jobs, particularly supporting small and medium-sized enterprise. Another thing mm -hmm. we can do, yeah. and my colleague Miriam Sapir will talk about this, is strengthen our trading relationship dramatically to open up new trading opportunities for countries of the region. Third, okay. we can identify opportunities for supporting young entrepreneurs in this region. And fourth, we can do a great deal, as already has been discussed in this panel earlier, in supporting small and medium-sized enterprises in this region. This doesn't mean foreign assistance is not important. We aim to do a lot in the area of foreign assistance, but we need to mobilize all of America's economic strengths Foreign assistance, yes. okay. investment, mm -hmm. trade, get, entrepreneurial, yeah. that's what we need to do to build I'll, this I'll relationship. I'll give you the chance to elaborate more, but I just want to be fair to everybody else. The okay. little bit of an opening statement, please, if you permit me, Mr. Gorer. Um, do you feel that uh, the, the, the Americans get it when it comes to this part of the world, whether it is in terms of trade, uh, the, uh, the type of relationship? Uh, I mean, it's, it's a good brand name, the U.S., United States of America and this region, but have they cashed in correctly in a way that it would be, like Mr. Musa said, a, a, an equal type of relationship? Is it happening? I think if you ask anybody in the Arab world, in the street, also at the government level, everybody wants to deal with the U.S. We want to deal with the U.S. as strategic partner, as, and we want to be treated as equal partner. Now, in the past, we have seen a zigzag in this relationship between the Arab world and the, the U.S. While there is a sincere feeling from everybody in the Arab world, we need to do that for four for reasons. For our businessmen, they want to deal with the U.S. because it's the biggest economy, and the U.S. comes at the top five trade partner with most Arab countries. So businessmen supporting that. Now, for our people, the U.S. is a full democracy country, so it's a nice model to follow. So our people love the, what they see in democracy there uh, in, the, in the U.S. For our government, they need to deal with the superpower. So we need to deal with the superpower. So our government, 
also have to deal with the U.S. Now for our, even our youth, they love this American brand. MTV, I, iPod, iPhone, they love American movie. Every single student wants to go to study, their dream to study in the U.S., but we have been receiving a mixed signal on all these four in, uh, issues. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. And if I have time, I can maybe elaborate on yes, that. Yes, I would like you to do that later on, as after Ms. Sapir tells us, uh, if, when John McCain says, uh, and which was picked up by Amr Musa, about the creating new uh, free trade uh, regions, what, have you been studying this for a long time? Or uh, how is that going to differ of, 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 in a way from the traditional way? Who do we allow to the WTO? Who do we not? You know, I mean, it's been a political decision, not only uh, an economic decision. How are you, what are you coming to the region with that is totally new? And what are, are you, how are you making it attractive mm -hmm. and trustworthy? What are we coming to the region with that's new? I would say, is a firm commitment to our partnership. We come as equals. We come because we want to build with each country in the region and the region as a whole, um, much more integrated and open economies. We don't come with preconceived ideas. We come wanting to sit down and have the kind of dialogue that we are having today We've started with governments around the region. How can we work together to boost trade and investment? Because it's, it's quite clear, and it's been proven time and time again throughout history, that to have a truly successful political transformation requires an equally successive economic transformation. And the good news is that we can use trade and investment to boost growth and create the jobs that we know countries here need Countries in other areas also need more job growth. That's true everywhere. The bad news is that it doesn't just come by wishing. We have to work very hard to do that. And it's going to require, in some cases, some very tough political choices that we can talk more about. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's get a little more specific, Amr Musa. Let's take Egypt. Egypt needs a lot of support. Uh, there is a transitional, transitional period that is rather a testy one for Egypt. Now, I know that we know that you have certain ambitions in playing a role in a transitional or, or the future of Egypt. Where is the U.S. role needed and could it be complementary could it be complemented or be complementary to, say, a GCC role in terms of, you know, sort of a, almost a Marshall Plan for Egypt so that the country does not fall out of its successes? Well, allow me uh, first to make very brief comments on a point that you have raised and another one that have, has been raised by colleagues here. You referred to a strategic alliance between NATO and the Gulf countries. I don't think that this expression is correct. There is cooperation, there was cooperation, uh, according to a resolution by the League of Arab States to work together with, under the umbrella of Security Council to save the civilian population, the citizens of Libya, from a massive air and rocket attacks. So this was the case so There was in a Libya strategic collaboration Libya. in Libya, yes. Yeah, this is number one. Number two, about the, the comprehensive relationship with the United States. Mm -hmm. In fact, what we need is to sit and talk about the strategic goals, including the Arab-Israeli conflict. This is a basic point that has to be cleared and clarified. And we hope that this would be dealt with in a, a balanced way. Otherwise, the security, stability, and peace will not really prevail. And security, stability, and peace are needed for the, the mm -hmm. Arab Spring to flourish. Right. Otherwise, the whole thing will go down the drain. What we need is a creative relationship, not creative anarchy. Mm -hmm. Now, talking, uh, answering your question, certainly we need the cooperation of the United States. The United States as the superpower and a, a very powerful uh, partner, very powerful uh, friend, uh, what, uh, of course, their influence and their assistance 
or their proposals would be added to the EU, World Bank or World Organizations, and the Gulf. And, and I'm not talking really about the Gulf as the Gulf, but about the Arab contribution to the Marshall Plan, or to Marshall Plan is, is, is just an expression, but for the revival plan uh, of uh, the economy in Egypt and elsewhere. So when I talk about uh, the, the Arab Spring, I talk about Tunis, about Egypt, about Libya, about Syria, about Yemen, about the rest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and I see prospects for that, and I see a leading role for the United States within that framework of a comprehensive approach. Mm -hmm. Mr. Gagash, do you think that there should be actually a particular role for the GCC in this time of transition in the Arab world? I mean, it really in, in, in real investments and in, in really giving what it takes because I, there are some who are arguing without such a genuine GCC role that delivers that uh, you know, things just cannot be uh, business as usual and go back to being spared. Well, I think away from the headlines, uh, what we have seen in the GCC over the last year has been a remarkable unison in terms of addressing issues of foreign policy. Uh, this uh, has not all necessarily been planned, but I think this has been uh, the reaction uh, to the moment. I think that, uh, you know, following many, many GCC uh, meetings over the last three, four years, uh, what I can say very clearly is that I have seen uh, a much, much more, uh, I would say, cohesive, uh, collective uh, foreign policy approach mm -hmm. in the G GCC. So uh, clearly, uh, I think part of it is we see that this cohesive policy uh, being more effective, but partly also its reaction to the historical monumental events uh, that, are, uh, that are in the region. Uh, the GCC continues to play an important role and as, uh, as uh, Amr Musa just mentioned, uh, the GCC came to the Arab League on the Libyan issue and uh, was able to come as a group and then uh, resort to the Arab League. And that was an important, really, and historical step in uh, events that took place in Libya. I think in the coming period, uh, we are also, the GCC, uh, again, uh, is looking at events in the Arab world and events in the Arab world, as I mentioned, you know, it's very difficult to read events. It's like trying to read the Russian Revolution sometime in 1918, mm -hmm. you know, just a few months after it has taken place. And that's really impossible. So I think for the GCC to be able also to contribute uh, more effectively, the, we need to also see a certain stabilization, uh, you know, that elections will actually uh, will, uh, will produce in various Arab countries. Uh, two things that John McCain said, well, let me take one of them. When he spoke on Iran, he said uh, that this is an issue that unifies the American people, that, um, that we will pr protect our friends, and uh, uh, no one should test our resolve. Is this still the cornerstone of the relationship between the GCC and the U.S., uh, or do you have another bone to pick with the, with the U.S. whenever you talk to them, which is the issue of Palestine? No, I think, uh, as again, I would uh, repeat also what, uh, what Mr. Amr Musa said, I think the issue of Palestine is extremely important. And I think right now uh, the U.S. has had actually a very uh, positive Arab Spring in terms of feelings towards the United States. And now there is a real test, I think, mm -hmm. in how the U.S. actually addresses the whole issue of, of uh, recognition of, uh, of Palestine in, in various international or organizations, UNESCO, uh, the UN, etc. I think this is a big, big test. And I hope that the U.S. does not fail this test. And Iran? Uh, Iran continues to be an important issue. It continues to be an issue that, uh, you know, we seek uh, to, uh, uh, to basically handle and de-escalate. And I think this will, uh, you know, the, the core of the issue is Iran's nuclear program and how it deals with the world community in, 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 in this nuclear program. And Bob Hormitz, you know, you hear it again and again, uh, how it is the Arab Spring, of course, it's the Arab inspiration. Uh, it, globally. 
but you hear it over and over again that one of the biggest problems in Arab-American uh, relations remains the issue of Israel, and that the Arab Spring is not going to shove that is issue under the table, as you know. Now, it seems that whatever goodwill you have in the United States by any administration or any president, the reason why the U.S. becomes dysfunctional is because of that relationship with Congress when it comes to delivering on an issue as important as this. Do you want to defend yourself on this, or do you want to say, uh, we'll fix it, we can do something about it? Well, uh, let, me, let me just, I can address the economic side of this equation. Maybe um, Mr. Shapiro would like to take the political the, one. Not the, <laughs> not the, not the Arab-Israeli side. Fortunately, there are people in our State Department who are devoting their lives and have for decades on this yeah, but that's a, basic, that's a basic issue it, it, that, is, that I, doesn't I, I, take... I don't, <laughs> I don't deny the issue. All I say right. is that it's not my issue because that's not my part of the State Department. So that may sound like an easy out, but it's a realistic way of looking at it. And they don't get into the economic side, and I avoid getting into their issues as well. But let me just make a point about the dysfunctionality of the United States that has been raised. I, I think that there has been this image about the United States being unable to reach agreement on certain things that are quite consequential, budget issues and other things. But I would also make the point that there are issues on which Americans can get together. And in fact, passing these three very important free trade agreements that were just passed, and Miriam was really one of the leaders in this effort, demonstrates that there are issues that the United States can pull together on and get a very substantial amount of bipartisan support. And I would extend that issue to the Arab Spring. And I would make the following point, that I, I think that economic reform is vital to political reform in the region, and political reform is vital to economic reform. They really have to go together. The second point I would make is, that the United States should be able to pull together, and this it requires the administration to take a great deal of leadership, no question about it, in explaining to the American people the enormous benefits for Americans of supporting the Arab Spring, of supporting the political reforms that are underway in the region, and supporting the economic reforms that are underway in the region. This is, I think, a critical moment, as I said at the outset, for the United States, for us to step up and demonstrate this support, both in terms of economic assistance and the kind of things that we've indicated we're going to do in, this, in the region, but also mobilizing mm -hmm. the very powerful uh, economic forces of American business who can play a very important role in the region in strengthening trade and strengthening investment in utilizing the institutions we have that can support small and medium-sized enterprises. And particularly, I think the point you made was a very compelling one, utilizing young Americans, American entrepreneurs and others, and having them engage with entrepreneurs in this region to help them create new businesses, invest in new businesses, build new businesses, create new opportunities. The key brand of the United States today, if you were to look at it from that point of view, and there are a lot of business people here, is that we have a society that, that is based on upward mobility, on opportunity, and on creativity. If we can work with companies and universities and young people in this region to support those kinds of efforts, I think that will have a very powerful economic effect and an even more powerful political effect. But we have to be a lot more creative than we have in the past about the kind of programs that we undertake to support right. the Arab Spring. It can't be just foreign assistance. It has to mobilize the entire set of forces of America's mm -hmm. economic dynamism. If we do yeah. that in the right way, I think yes. we can have a very powerful impact mm -hmm. on this. And region. Mr. Herrera, is, is the, United, uh, the Americans, is Mr. Hormuz sort of taking the opportunity, that, that business opportunity in the region, are they taking it for granted? Are they just some how walking in, you know, the Americans have weak economy, have trouble at home, and they're saying, well, there is an opportunity for me here. Or is this an opportunity that's good for really the Arab Spring? One does not negate the other, Mr. Gorer, but can you take it from I, there? I, I think in, in, to a, Mr. in, in one sense, it ha in one <laughs> sense, American business has to see an interest in doing this. 
On the other <laughs> hand, they have to see an, a long-term interest mm -hmm. in doing it. And that's yeah. the key point, I think. Yeah, what, Mr. Lorraine? You see, uh, I agree with my previous speaker that uh, to help strengthen this relationship and not allow it to zigzag, uh, you know, Palestinian issue is critical. But as a, a businessman, I've seen how American policy work in the region. I mean, we had American policy on free trade. I mean, there are few countries in the Arab world, they jammed the free trade agreement and put it on fast track, and then probably in three to six months, that free trade agreement was jammed to us and have these nations sign up. UAE took a stand on this, and then they have tried to go through this fast track of free trade, and there was, without really allowing this agreement to go through due diligence, you know, and go through the government and the parliament and etc., and they want to have that done quickly. But we discovered the double standard that applied when the Dubai World acquired P&O, uh, uh, ports operating system, uh, in, out of UK, but on some ports in the, in the US. And during the free trade agreement, they say, hold, hold on, you can't own this. So they have forced the acquisition to, to sell, and that was during the free trade agreement. So we have realized, you know, uh, there is a double standard, and this kind of double standard doesn't really work in a strategic uh, uh, partnership. So uh, such signal is not good for the long relationship, and we want really the U.S., and we're really genuine, we want to do work with the U.S., but we want to treat us as equal, and we have also our process to go through, and they should respect sometimes the process we go through, and it's not only one way, and then you have to sign this agreement. Ms. Shapiro, I'd like to give you the opportunity to respond, if you wish. Thank you. You couldn't have set that up better if uh, you I had didn't. Tried. I didn't read his mind, but it's good. I like it. <laughs> <You're> my colleague. <laughs> um, let me make a few points, if I may. Um, first of all, I stand by what I said, that our approach is one of partnership. We don't have a magic formula to offer to very smart, very capable leaders in the region. We want to work with you to figure out what are concrete steps that we can take with immediate to short-term benefits on trade and investment, with medium benefits, and then with long-term advantages as well. The United States has laid out a very ambitious agenda in terms of creating this new partnership of equals. Uh, with the MENA region, ultimately, if we do this right, leading to a regional trade arrangement that we define together. With respect to investment issues and, and trade questions, we do have a very open economy. Many people say that's why uh, we have built such a powerhouse. We believe the same lessons we've learned through tariff reduction, through creating uh, mechanisms for bringing down non-tariff barriers. The barriers you can't see are sometimes the most difficult obstacles to trade and creating open investment. We still have review mechanisms for investment decisions. In fact, it's no secret that we review proposed investments uh, by companies from across the range, including our closest allies, United Kingdom, France, etc. I happen to sit on uh, what we call the CFIUS Committee, the Committee on uh, Investment, Foreign Investment in the United States. And I see applications from companies all over the world. So again, it's, it's a partnership and it's a spirit of, of uh, commitment and uh, excitement that we enter into this new dialogue and work with the countries, with mm -hmm. Egypt, with Tunisia, to figure out what are the building blocks that we can put in place that truly will boost trade and will bring greater foreign investment because we believe those mechanisms hold great promise. I will get back to the issue of what you're doing in Egypt and Tunisia and take it a little bit further, but I think Mr. Gorir has a comment no, on what I mean, you said. Uh, we love uh, Marianne ideas to be as equal partner, but I mean, and P&O &O, P &O was owned by a foreign country, foreign and shifted from ownership from a British company to a UAE company. And then the US came in and said, no Arab company can own uh, a port in, in the US. Mm. So that's not free trade. I mean, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 
Ms. Sapiro? If I can respond, I mean, um, every situation, you have to look at the facts as well. Um, there are certain cases, they come up very rarely when there are security issues at stake involving a proposed foreign investment. So like all countries, we look at those uh, with as open a mind as possible. And I think overall, if you look at our record on open investment, inviting foreign investment in the United States, helping our investors seek new markets in the UAE, in Tunisia, in Egypt, I think we have a pretty good track record. But we're not resting on our laurels. As I said, we want to make it better. We want to work with you uh, to make this relationship far more ambitious and for, more effective for, for both parties because, frankly, we have our own challenges at home in terms of boosting employment, uh, perhaps not as great, uh, but nonetheless, creating new jobs and the economic growth that can sustain jobs we have and create additional jobs is fundamental for each and every economy represented in this room today. I, I, we are short on time. I'm not going to be able to take too many questions or from, from the floor, except that I will take only four together and quickly, because I need to get back to the panel and engage. I'll take four questions only if somebody uh, has um, a microphone so that I could see them. Do you have the microphone out there? Yes. Could you come up front from Mr. Janahi? Needs, well, stay in the back there, first of all, and then you could come up front. Please, very, very yeah. short. Very, very short. <laughs> My name is Moawiyah Zabian. I would like to ask, there is Brazil, group, China, India, who are interested in our region. And the United States now have a chance. And the price is very obvious. We are asking for, you know, like most of the panelists avoided the major issue, which is our concern about opening up with the United States. Although our heart is with it, but there is a, the biggest issue. And please, you know, for the sake of, you know, respecting our intelligence for this region, address this issue directly. I'm up to, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Go ahead, Mr. Janahi. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, Khaled Janahi, um, a question uh, for Mr. Gergash and uh, a comment, quick comment for Abdelaziz. Uh, Mr. Gergash, uh, we have this year most of the budgets in the Gulf. The oil was at eighty dollars. We're already making around, I think, three to. $350 million of surplus over and above the surplus that we had. Why the heck do we need, I mean, I, what Bob Holmer said about financial support to Egypt and Tunisia, why do we need that financial support with you guys having $350 billion? And since we are sitting in a session here for creating jobs in the Arab world, we need 10 to 15 million jobs between Egypt and some of these countries. Why don't you invest that in those countries? That's just one question. Okay, well, Number, just... No, yeah. yeah, one quick... Mr. No, Janahi, no, 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 comment, no, comment, a comment to Abdul Aziz. Yeah, Abdul Aziz, very Abdul Aziz mentioned the PNO, which I think was a very good thing, but the biggest, one of the biggest insults as an Arab that we've had during that time was Sultan bin Islam coming out when the Americans talk about security issues, saying they will appoint a non-Arab person to chair the company in the United States. That was the biggest insult. So as much as it was good what you said, but that was a big insult for us. That was a requirement. Are you done? Yeah, go ahead. Did you, are you satisfied? No, go that ahead. was a requirement that we, we put some local people to manage, to give them peace of mind. Okay. I, I have a question directly to you, Mr. Gargash. Uh, <laughs> yes. I... I think that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not here to defend the Gulf's record on issues of investment, but I think investment is also connected to politics. And I think to a certain extent we need to see more clarity in many countries that are undergoing, uh, you know, the turmoil of, of, of revolutionary changes. And I think this is normal. The Gulf has thrived for a long time on uh, the issue of stability. And I think it's normal for us to see where, uh, where these countries are moving. We're still in, in early, early days, really. And, of course, there has been many different packages that are being discussed with Egypt. There are many different packages between various Gulf countries. But I think many countries are waiting to see some clarity mm -hmm. in political conditions, in investment conditions. Because while this is happening, 
Also, our investments in Egypt are going through turbulence right now, and we're trying to sort these out uh, with the Egyptian government. Just, just to push that point a little uh, further, forgive, uh, forgive me, this is not ganging up against you, but it just seems very, very essential to think faster and do faster. It is not the time that we can afford to study yeah. after study. Uh, yeah. This is a yeah. very important yeah. time, that's and why the delivery true. is slow. I mean, coming from the Gulf, I'm uh, used to people ganging against us. So it's not a problem here. <laughs> He's from the Gulf. <laughs> but, uh, but I think that uh, I don't think we've known for being very, very fast. I think we are known for being, uh, you know, for being supportive. We will play our role, but I think it's extremely important in Egypt's case, for example, that the investment climate for our companies is clearer. Many, many problems that they're having are sorted out, that we see a little bit with some clarity beyond the political fog, and I think this is extremely important before major commitments are taking mm -hmm. place. Um, I know that <clears throat> there's a, a question from the back that was about China and, and Russia, but I want to go to Mr. Amr Musa and try to handle this from uh, a point of view of the BRICS influence in uh, political positions in the Arab world. So the countries, the BRICS, of course, it's uh, Brazil, Russia, China, uh, South Africa, and India, who happen to be members of the Security Council and who are accused of really playing political uh, or taking political positions that are not sometimes to the liking of some Arabs. Of course, they um, have uh, blocked action on Syria. They have come around eventually on, Iraq, on, on Libya after having been very difficult about it. So, uh, do you feel that this is, uh, Mr. Musa, is this something that is for strategic political considerations? Is it for economic considerations? Uh, how do you view the relationship between the BRICS and uh, the you know sort of NATO members on the Security Council? Well, uh, I believe that the BRICS uh, countries are basically our friends. We uh, belong to the same group of uh, third world countries uh, with a lot of cooperation and history of... Uh, China uh, and Russia, not, not uh, any longer including third world. China, <laughs> Including China, in a sense. Uh, but blocking uh, the resolutions in the Security Council has become a, uh, a style now. They have blocked uh, the resolution on Syria, but others have blocked the resolution on Palestine. Not yet. So it's we'll not, have it's to, not voted uh, yet. It's promised. To to, they, they're promising to block. No, no, yes. We have to take that into consideration. That, yes, there is uh, something in the Security Council and with uh, those countries that we can talk to them, and I believe we are talking to them now, about a... Uh, a, a better or a different attitude towards our, uh, our problems, especially that we have now something new in the region called the change in the Middle East. That change in the Middle East has to be taken seriously and not to be played with uh, uh, within this uh, kind of international politics. Change in the Middle East from dictatorship to democracy is a game that will have to be taken seriously to block or to block a resolution that is intended to defend the, the, the civilian population uh, had to be discussed with our friends uh, Russia, China and mm -hmm. the BRICS. Uh, uh, okay, BRICS, the rest of the BRICS. Uh, but the, the, the change in the Middle East has not yet become an issue of utmost international priority. They have to understand that. It's not a question of economic assistance. Mm -hmm. It is not a question of uh, just a small debate. It is a basic issue in our life. Mm. Basic issue. This has to be taken seriously and I believe it is our duty as Arab politicians and diplomats to make that point very clear. Mm -hmm. This change in the Middle East, in the Arab world is very, very serious. We don't want anybody to play havoc with it. Yeah, I stand corrected because when, I, when you said the other's veto, I thought you were talking about the threat of veto by the U.S. on the Palestinian issue, although what you meant probably is the veto exercised on the settlements already. So I stand corrected in terms of veto, veto struggle between... There's a threat and there is an exercise. An exercise as well. Uh, but but so, so you, anybody wants to address the question as it was poised, posed by the BRICS? Go ahead, please. The first question, yeah. Um, let me say that we've been talking about the Arab Spring. It's now the Arab Fall. I agree with Raisha, time is of the essence. 
not just on the panel, but time is, is, is moving so quickly. At the same time, we acknowledge that these kinds of fundamental economic and political changes are not going to happen uh, overnight. Um, with respect to the first question uh, that was asked, uh, we are very proud of the relationships that we already have with many countries in the region, nearly a half dozen free trade agreements, nearly a dozen trade and investment framework agreements. In fact, we've been negotiating our 12th with the Gulf, with the GCC now, for some time, and I will fly tonight to Abu Dhabi and then on to Dubai and hope to make progress in closing that agreement so we will have yet another framework for greater trade and investment in this region. And I mentioned our ambition to work with our partners and try to forge more of a regional trade and investment arrangement that I think will have very significant benefits for all. But these arrangements and agreements take time. And what we really want to focus on with the countries and my colleagues in those countries is short and medium term measures that can deliver real results and real benefits to the peoples whose lives depend on jobs and on um, salaries to put food on the table. With respect to the BRICS, you will find the U.S. economy far more open and inviting for trade and investment to the MENA region, then China, then Brazil, then India. Uh, believe me on this, and if you don't, I welcome, I welcome you to test the waters yourselves. I wish it wasn't true. I wish all economies were as open as ours. But uh, brings me back to my initial point. By this kind of economic liberalization, reducing tariffs, reducing the non-tariff barriers, for once and for all, I think we can do a lot together to boost mm -hmm. trade, medium term, and long term as well as short term. In order term. for me to make this uh, a final word by the panel and going backward, I'll stay with you, Ms. Sapiro, and to tell me in one sentence, what worries you most that could cause the deterioration of the U.S. of the Arab-American relationship? Just in a sentence, what is the one thing that makes you afraid and worried about it? And I'm going to go backward for considering this a concluding remark. From the trade and economic perspective, I worry that there'll be um, so much attention on the very important and critical political decisions that need to be made that there won't be enough political will left over to make some of the tough decisions that I've outlined in terms of concrete measures to boost trade at the border, to agree on basic principles for investment that will bring foreign investment to this region in greater numbers than we have seen. So I hope there'll be enough political will for the tough economic decisions that, that need to be made and that will bring benefits to the region. Thank, thank you, Mr. Sapir. Thank you for participating in this panel. Mr. Gurir? Not listening to what we want. We need that communication to start and to have two-way communication and take us as a strategic partner, not only on slogan. Yeah. Mr. Holmes? Yeah, I, th I think the key from an American point of view is that we're used to in our past making pronouncements about the world. Now we have to listen to what's coming out of the Arab world. There are a lot of thoughts, there's a lot of creativity here. We should be in a position to respond and respond in a constructive way, but it has to be a relationship of equals, and we have to be able to find ways of identifying in particular with young people in the region. It strikes me that from an American point of view... Yeah, but that's not about what scares you, Bob. I'm wondering what, what what's, what's making what you... What scares me... What would, what, what, what would scare me is if we did not listen well enough to the region and we went about policies that were not responsive to the needs of the people in the region. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't do that, we will not respond to, to what people on the Arab street and people in the shops and people mm -hmm. in the bazaars and people who are making this revolution think and want us to do. Mm -hmm. We have to, this is a learning experience for us. And we have to learn from what these people are saying and Thank respond you. constructively. And that Thank means, and it, that means taking tough political decisions to respond to the constructive <laughs> approaches we hear from the Arab world. Thank you very much. Mr. Gargash? Yes, I think, I think we all agree uh, that America's relations with the Arab world is an extremely important and multifaceted uh, relationship. I think what, what worries me is that this relationship should uh, 
stay as much as possible even-handed and consistent because there are too many issues uh, that can uh, tip the balance a little bit in the relationship. So the overall even-handedness and consistency of America's approach towards the Arab world is extremely important. Thank you, Mr. Gagash. Mr. Musa? Well, I agree with what uh, Sheikh Abdul Aziz uh, has said about the strategic relationship and the double standard. And I would add the uh, political side to what he has said. Yes, indeed, we have to be taken more seriously. Uh, we need an even-handed policy, in a way, as, as uh, the minister uh, mentioned now. But the essence of what Sheikh Abdul Aziz has said is really the right thing to be said on behalf of all of us in the Arab world. And uh, what worries me as an Arab American who really lives in both worlds and understands both worlds is uh, it, that what, what, what worries me is that the continued talking across one another and I think that has happened people to people and it is very essential that uh, we avoid the pitfalls of the past. I want to thank you for joining us, Mr. Sapiro, Mr. Agurir, uh, Mr. Hormatz. Mr. Gargash, Mr. Musa, my name is Raghi Dadargham of Al Haya, and I thank you for joining us. Have a good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated. A conversation with Mahmoud Jabri.